Hello, everyone. I'd like you to pause for a moment and take a look at your neighbor. Are they happy? Are they sad? Maybe a little bit excited? Now imagine if your face didn't communicate what you wanted to show to the world. Imagine if your facial expression wasn't a reflection of who you truly are. Now for some patients, whether because of trauma or surgeries or cancer, their facial expression may not reflect who they really are. This is my patient, Betty. She came to see me at the neuroplastic surgery program at the Ohio State University. Now, it's a long journey for Betty to get here. And I parallel that to my journey to becoming a neuroplastic surgeon here. My journey started in a small village on the island of Jamaica called Gibraltar. It's so small that on most maps it's not even labeled, but it's up on the north coast near the town of Ochoreas. I grew up in a very large family with six brothers and sisters. And one of my vivid childhood memories is one of my younger brothers suffering from seizures. And that was my first inspiration to wanting to become a physician. Now, in my town, it was pretty much a pipe dream to say, I want to be a physician. I didn't know any physicians, and no one in my family had even been to college. And so it was that after graduating high school, I found myself working as a waitress in Ochoreas. Call it serendipity or luck, but I met a college recruiter who was vacationing in Jamaica while waitressing, and she told me about opportunities to come to the United States. So opportunities and growth and innovation often take risk. And so for me, it was a risk to come to the United States, to leave my family, leave all the familiar for growth. And so it was that I was able to come to the United States and attend college and go on to medical school and become a neuroplastic surgeon. So too, the Ohio State University had to take a risk and recognize that innovation requires risk and invest in programs such as the neuroplastic surgery program so that we can help patients like Betty. So here is a photograph of Betty in the middle, and you can see that she has some facial differences. On the CT scan, or it's a 3D reconstruction of the CT scan image on your left, you can see that some of her bone is missing, and this is what is causing this facial abnormality. There are pieces of bone that has somewhat dissolved over time, what we call bone resorption, this may be due to things such as infections, inadequate blood supply. So Betty had had numerous life-saving surgeries to protect her brain, but over time, this has caused the bone to dissolve. So for many years, Betty lived like this. This is a CAT scan or CT scan of Betty's brain. And it, what you may be able to appreciate is that it's not in the typical round configuration that you'd expect of a brain. And this is because the brain itself doesn't really have a round structure. It conforms to the casing of the skull. And so the skull provides that shape that helps the brain to have its normal round configuration. So in Betty's case, because there's no bone, it causes this configuration. Now, this is not simply about aesthetics or the appearance. It also has functional implications. Here's a video of Betty in, from one of her clinic visits with me. Betty, can you open your eyes for me? Hey, I need you to open your eyes. Okay. Can you tell me your full name? Okay. So what you may be able to appreciate is that she has significant neurological deficits. Her speech is impacted, her mental status is impacted, her balance is also impaired, and so she's not really able to walk and navigate stairs, so she most frequently gets around in a wheelchair. So for patients like Betty, this is not abnormal. They have very complex care needs. Betty is a typical neurotrauma patient who is, needs to see a neurosurgeon. They may need to see plastic surgery, radiology, advanced practice providers, nutritionists, social workers, neurologists, therapists, infectious disease doctors, and on and on and on. This is a very complex care system that the patients often have to navigate. These providers may be located in different locations, maybe even different cities, different states. Appointments on different days of the week. Imagine the burden for the patient, as well as for their caregivers to have to navigate these complex care systems. It's very disjointed and fragmented. Is this a system of health? 
what is hope anyway? In 1949, over 70 years ago, the World Health Organization defined health as a total state of physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease. Now imagine that he is able to come to the neuroplastic surgery program at the Ohio State University. She's able to see all the people she needs to see. And behind the scenes, we take on the burden of coordinating the care for the patient. Is this a better system of health? So Betty comes to see us and we perform her surgery. We remove the pieces of bone that were dissolved and we create custom implants to recreate the configuration of her skull. Now these implants aren't designed to just protect the brain and recreate the skull. We also systematically design these implants so that the patient's aesthetic appearance is restored. Their normal facial expressions is restored as best as possible. So on the image on your left, you're able to see the implants that we created and we secured in place with hardware. And then on your right, you can see over time Betty's brain has expanded back to that round, typical configuration of the brain. And it now fits that encasement that we have provided with these implants. Again, this is not simply aesthetics. There are also functional implications. So I'd like to show you a video. This is three weeks after her surgery. Betty came to see us in clinic. Come, Betty. Oh my gosh, you look amazing. Can you tell me your full name? Betty Jane Richards. Wow, how old are you? 22. Okay, and where are you right now? You're 24. 24. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see she's still. <laughs> so you can see she still has some neurological deficits, but undeniably she's dramatically improved. Her speech has improved, her mental status has improved. Her ability to walk, her balance has improved after some rehabilitation. And she's not only able to walk in the hallways of the clinic, but she's also able to navigate the stairs at her home. And it's at this point that we can say Betty has a condition called syndrome of the trephine, which interestingly, we diagnose it after the patient improves. It's due to a piece of the skull being missing, and when you replace that, whether the skull is replaced or an implant to replace the skull, the brain expands to its normal configuration and the patient improves. So, it took a while for Betty to get here, over 10 years. And for us to think about what prevented her from seeing us earlier, right? Was it necessarily her bone was resorbing and dissolving and her facial features were changing and her parents were changing. Family saw this, clinicians saw this. She wasn't really referred. So then let's take a look at why was she referred. Over time, the resorbed bone finally poked through her scalp and created a small wound. And this wound was immediately recognized as a medical necessity. That this is not cosmetic, it's a wound. So on one hand, we have these dramatic changes happening with her brain and her skull but it was not recognized as a medical necessity. And so she was rec referred for the wound. So one of the big barriers here is the knowledge deficits. Patients often don't know what care is available, and clinicians may not know that patients can improve with care, appropriate care. Access to care. Patients from rural areas or faraway towns may not be near large centers such as Ohio State where they're able to easily access care. Imagine if we had a fragmented care system, how much more challenging that would be for the patient. Finally, insurance coverage. How are they gonna afford to pay for this care? If we say this is a cosmetic problem or an aesthetic deformity, it is not covered by insurance. It has to be clearly defined as a medical necessity for insurance to pay for the patient's care. So how are we as clinicians doing with clearly documenting that these aesthetic issues may have functional implications? Well, we surveyed all the databases or we looked at all the databases and we found over 2,000 articles that are looking at patient outcomes after craniopathy surgery. And what we found was that of these 2,000 articles, only two addressed aesthetic complications. Two of 2,000 address aesthetic complications after craniopathies. We can do better. Medicine has advanced tremendously over the last century, even over the last decade. 
And we have created en enormous novel innovations that were able to provide life-saving care for our patients. Now, the charge for us is to move beyond surviving to where we're moving beyond the diseases and caring for our patients and putting the patient into focus. Let's move beyond here. We can take a look at Betty. I'll have you pause for a moment. That is when she first came to our clinic. Here she is immediately after our surgery. And then here she is two years later. What does her face communicate to us? We can do better and advance and grow. With innovation and the technologies available to us, we can move beyond the diseases and start focusing on what the patient's outcomes are. Let's move beyond trauma, disease, strokes, cancer, surviving. Let's focus on living and thriving. Let's focus on improved quality of life and helping everyone live their lives to the fullest. Thank you.